Biology 107 Lab 8, Extraction of Plasma DNA from E. coli and Analysis by Gel Electrophoresis. In today's lab, we're going to have two parts. The part A, we're going to extract plasma DNA from E. coli, and the part B, we're going to analyze it by gel electrophoresis. This DNA we're extracting today is also going to be used in next week in lab 9, where we're going to transform E. coli cells. In today's lab, plasma DNA will be extracted from E. coli. The strain of E. coli we're using, therefore, has two forms of DNA. It has genomic DNA and plasma DNA. The bacterial cell has many other types of macromolecules, including phospholipids, cellular proteins, metabolites. Pay attention to how we will specifically be extracting the plasma DNA from all of these other cellular components. We will be extracting the plasmas using a commercially available plasma preparation kit, also called a plasmid mini prep kit. This kit includes several buffers and a special spin column for binding DNA. The kit simplifies many of the steps in the procedure and avoids the use of more harmful compounds such as phenol that have been used in older protocols. You are responsible for understanding how the procedure works. Detailed information on each step is found in the lab manual. The first step is harvesting the E. coli cells from a culture. This will be done by pipetting culture into microfuge tubes, small 1.5 mil tubes commonly used in laboratories. The microfuge tubes are placed in a microfuge, a small centrifuge, to pellet the E. coli cells. This process may need to be repeated a few times to harvest enough cells for the plasma preparation procedure. I will now show you a brief video of me harvesting E. coli cells. Cell harvesting. The first step is to take the E. coli culture and put it into the microfuge tubes. The microfuge tubes can then be put into the microfuge, making sure that both tubes are balanced then we can securely fasten the lid. Close the door and spin the tubes for 15,000 RPMs for one minute. Once the minute is done, we can take off the lid and take a look at our cell pellet. And there's our cell pellet. It's a little bit on the small end, so what we're going to do is remove the liquid supernatant and repeat this procedure about five times to get a larger pellet. There's a much larger cell pellet, which is perfect for doing our plasmid extraction. Once the cells are harvested, we are going to remove the liquid supernatant and use the solutions in the kit to extract the plasmid DNA. The cells are first resuspended in solution PD1. This is an isotonic solution used to resuspend the bacterial cells. It also contains an RNAase that will digest any RNA present. Next, PD2 buffer is added. This contains two main ingredients. The first is a strong detergent called sodium dodecyl sulfate. This detergent denatures proteins and disrupts the plasma membrane, causing the cells to lyse and their contents to spill out. The second ingredient in PD2 is sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide will denature the DNA. This means that the hydrogen bonds between the base pairs will break and the two backbones of the DNA helix will separate. Due to supercoiling, the DNA strands of the plasmids will not separate significantly. Afterwards, PD3 buffer is added. This buffer is an acidic solution that neutralizes the pH of the solution. This causes the hydrogen bonds in the genomic DNA to reform, which causes random base pairing and the genomic DNA will create a tangled, insoluble mass that will precipitate out of solution. You can see the precipitate there is kind of a white color in my diagram. Many proteins and other cell debris will also precipitate out of solution here. At this point, we will centrifuge the sample to remove all the precipitated proteins and genomic DNA will end up in the pellet at the bottom of the tube. The supernatant from this step will now contain your plasma DNA and various other small molecules and metabolites. The supernatant will be added to a PD spin column. The PD spin column contains a special glass fiber matrix that binds plasma DNA under high salt conditions. There goes the supernatant. When centrifuged, the plasma DNA will bind to the glass fiber and all other aqueous contaminants will pass through effectively isolating the plasmid. At, that, at this step, an ethanol wash is done to remove any salts and any other soluble contaminants present from the buffers used in the previous steps. Lastly, an elution buffer will be used. The elution buffer has an alkaline pH of 8.5, which allows the DNA to detach from the glass matrix and be collected in the microfuge tube for storage. 
We will now watch a brief video of the procedure. I also have a longer video uh, of this procedure that explains all the steps in much more detail. I will link it here in this video now. This is a very brief overview of the plasma preparation procedure. The first step after harvesting the cells is to add the PD-1 resuspension buffer. This buffer is used to resuspend the cell pellet and also contains an RNAase, which will digest any RNA that happens to be present. The next step is to add the PD-2 buffer. The PD-2 buffer has a detergent, which will dissolve away the membrane, spilling out the cell contents. It also has sodium hydroxide, which will break hydrogen bonds in DNA. This particularly affects the genomic DNA. The sodium hydroxide can be neutralized using the PD-3 buffer, which has uh, acid in it, and this will cause the genomic DNA to precipitate and also will precipitate uh, most of the cellular proteins. The plasma DNA is safe from this precipitation procedure because it is supercoiled and therefore protected from the whole uh, denaturing process. There is our precipitate after centrifugation. At this stage, we need the uh, liquid, the lysate, from that step, and we're going to add it to the PD spin column. The PD spin column has a special glass filter in it that will capture the plasma DNA once that goes through the centrifuge. There's the liquid. We can discard that, and we're going to keep the PD spin column with the plasma on it. After that, this goes through a quick washing step. The wash buffer is mostly just ethanol. After that is put through the centrifuge, we discard the ethanol waste, and we're going to put the tube into a new microfuge tube that is ready to collect the DNA. The very last step, we're adding Lucian buffer. The Lucian buffer has a little bit of a higher pH, which is going to allow the DNA to unbind from the glass filter and then be captured in the bottom of the tube. And there is our plasmid. In part B of today's lab, we will analyze the DNA sample produced in part A by agrose gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is a commonly used method worldwide for separating DNA, RNA, and proteins. Here is a photo of an agrose gel. An agrose gel electrophoresis uses agrose, a carbohydrate from seaweed, as a gelling agent to make a gel-like matrix. Notice the gel here has little wells or slots for the DNA samples. Here is a diagram of an electrophoresis apparatus. There's our gel in the middle, there's our sample wells. The gel itself is immersed into a buffer solution. This is a salt solution capable of conducting an electrical current. So this apparatus is connected to a power source and the power source will provide an electrical field that will go through the gel over about an hour of time. So DNA, there's a diagram of DNA there. DNA is negatively charged overall because of all those phosphate groups that are found on the backbone. So once we apply the electrical field, the DNA is going to travel from the uh, sample wells, which are near the negatively charged cathode, towards the positively charged anode. So here's a photo of the electrophoresis apparatus we have in the biology lab at Keno College. As mentioned before, when the electrical current is turned on, the DNA is repulsed from the cathode and attracted to the anode, causing it to migrate through the agarose gel. The agarose gel impedes the movement of the DNA. Small fragments of DNA are impeded less than larger fragments and therefore move through the gel more quickly. The gel also contains a chemical called ethidium bromide, which allows us to see the uh, DNA under UV light. Let's watch a video of the gel electrophoresis process. Here's my gel, so I'm gonna load it now. So what I'm going to do is get uh, 10 microliters of the molecular weight marker. So if you take a look, it has a bit of a dye in there and the dye is gonna help us to uh, watch it while it runs during the electrophoresis process. So I wanna be very careful because this has ethidium bromide in it, which is a known carcinogen. So what I wanna do is basically get my sample into those wells right there. Okay, so I gotta be very careful. I wanna deliver it to the well, but not uh, necessarily puncture the agros. So usually what I do is just to give myself a steady hand as I hold my hand, and then I'm going to basically stick it into the buffer and very carefully inject it into the well. So there it is. There's the molecular weight marker. 
Next, I'm going to load my sample. So here is my plasmid sample. Same thing, I'm also going to load 10 microliters, so 5 microliters of loading buffer and 5 microliters of sample. So it is also going to get delivered to the well. Here is my electrophoresis apparatus, so my agarose gel is attached to the power source. You can see it's set at 100 volts. This whole process is going to take about an hour. Basically what is happening now is an electrical field is going through the gel and the DNA and the dye should start running towards the red, the positive electrode. If you take a careful look, maybe you can see that there are bubbles inside the tank uh, at the uh, negative electrode. That tells me that the process is going and that it is running. If you look very carefully at the gel, you can see that the dye has already started to migrate a little bit away from the wells. The gel has been running now for about an hour at 100 volts. Let's take a quick look here. You can see that the dyes, there's actually different dyes in the loading buffer, uh, two different shades of blue and an orangey yellowy color. They've run down the length of the gel, so that means that it's time for us to take a look at the gel. To visualize our gels, we're going to use that instrument over there that is called the gel dock. The gel dock is basically a big box. I'm going to put my gel in the box, and the big box has a camera and it has ultraviolet light. So the ultraviolet light is going to allow the thetium bromide in the DNA to glow and then we're going to be able to see uh, the DNA in our samples. So there it is right there. When I shut the door, the ultraviolet light is going to go on. And look at that. We can see our DNA samples. So what I'm going to do now is take a photograph of the gel and uh, print it off and uh, it will be part of your lab 8-9 uh, live report. So let us discuss how to analyze an agarose gel. So you can see here is a typical agarose gel. I found this on the internet from a quick uh, just Google image search. You can see there are a number of things labeled. So one thing that I want to point out is that the uh, cathode would have been at the top of the gel. So that's where the wells would have been and the anode at the bottom. And so the bottom is where the smaller fragments will have run because they run a little bit faster. On the left side of the gel in lane one, that is a molecular weight marker. So this is a uh, um, a sample that has standard uh, DNA sizes in it so that you can uh, estimate the size of the DNA in your samples. So this goes from 1.5 to 6 uh, kilobase pairs. So that's 1,500 to 6,000 base pairs in, in terms of DNA size. And uh, samples 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are various samples. And in this case here, I didn't give you the full label, just label them sample A, B, C, all the way to E. Let's take a look at our agarose gel. Here's our gel as presented on the gel dock. You can see there's the sample wells. And the first sample there, that is my molecular weight marker. And you can see different bands there. I'll come back and talk about that in a moment. And there's our plasma DNA. I actually loaded two different samples of the plasma DNA. The first sample on the left, I loaded about five microliters. And the one on the right, I loaded about 20 microliters. I wanted to make sure I had a really nice gel to show everybody so that we had something to look at for our class. But you can see, can see the plasmid on the left sample. Uh, you may notice on the right sample, our plasmid actually has two bands. So what is happening there is that the band on the bottom is probably the supercoiled DNA and the band on the top is linearized DNA. So sometimes in the plasma preparation procedure, uh, the DNA uh, breaks a little bit, and so we get it linearized, and so it runs a little bit more slowly than, this, than the uh, really compact supercoiled DNA. This here is the ladder that we used. It's called a Phage Lambda DNA Hindi 3 Digest, and uh, it's just something you can buy from a company. It's relatively cheap, and you can see it has some standard sizes of bands. So our gel, we didn't quite run it far enough to get all the bands resolved, but you can uh, you can probably make out where some of those bands are. Uh, the top two bands, I'm guessing, have sort of merged into one, so the 23,000 and 9,400 band. Uh, it's a little hard to tell without uh, uh, resolving that a little bit more. I think maybe next time I'll run the gel a little bit further, but you can definitely make out the 2322 and the 2027 band there. And our plasma, it looks like it's pretty heavy, and I think in the notes I've mentioned that it's about 10 kilobase pairs, which uh, does seem to line up and match what we're seeing here on the gel. So what do you need to do with uh, the gel for your lab assignment? 
So what you need to do for our gel is give the gel a title. And uh, this title, as usual, is going to include a binomial name of the organism that we used. You're going to crop it and you're going to label it neatly with a legend. So I don't want uh, arrows all over the place. I want a nice legend, just something like this. And uh, make sure that, like I said, you have a good descriptive title that describes uh, what is going on in the experiment. So what I've noticed from some of your lab reports is some people do not seem to know how to crop images. If you take a look, here's the image uh, that I'm going to provide for you. And there is a nice cropped image. So I'm going to show you how to do that here. Uh, in Microsoft Word. It also works the same way in PowerPoint and a number of other programs. So here's a gel that I uh, put the image directly into um, Microsoft Word. And if you take a look at the top, you're going to click on Format. And then under Format, you're going to see a little box that says Crop. When you click on Crop, uh, you'll get those little bars on the outside of your image. And you can drag those bars and crop your image and make it look really nice. So this brings us to the end of lab eight. As I mentioned before, labs eight and nine are connected. So the DNA that we extracted today will be used in the lab nine experiment, but they uh, do have a combined short report. If you do want to get a head start on the lab eight, nine short report, there are all the questions there. You can see questions one, two, and three are all pertaining to lab eight and question four will be pertaining to uh, lab nine. So lab nine will be completed next week and the short report will be due the following week. That's all for now. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.